become attracted um, to the project through that, hopefully. Um, and also welcome to anybody who you know. I'm sure there are a lot of people who you've brought along yeah. from America as well. And um, yeah, so I'll be, I'll be quite brief in introducing uh, myself to anybody who doesn't know me. Um, I'm Ven Chanda, um, disciple of Ajahn Brahm and trying to establish a little project in England, a monastery for women. And I always take great inspiration from the nuns at Aloka Vihara in California because I think your model is very close to what I'd like to achieve in the very long run. But for us, it's really seeds because I'm alone here. I don't have other monastics to help me. So it's the beginnings. Um, but we are part of a global Sangha. And I think that's something very beautiful, you know, to be reminded of that. And to, um, yeah, I was really fortunate to be able to stay at Aloka Vihara twice one time during the rains retreat that they were having, which is the winter time for them, and another time in the sort of spring, summer season, and get to know the wonderful bikinis over there. So uh, before I introduce you, Aya, I wanted to just um, introduce you to our two co-hosts who've been helping with these Zoom sessions, and that's Anne-Marie at the top in the corner on my screen, and Mel, Mel P, do you wanna wave? <laughs> and they're really professional now, especially at um, organising the Q&A session. So they will um, automatically call out people's names who have their hand up and unmute them. So you won't have to do anything. You'll just have to answer okay. or speak back to whoever raises their voice. Sometimes it's a question. Sometimes it might be just a sharing. So um, I wanted to introduce Ayo and Underbody just by uh, reading the biography, the little bio that she sent in for us. So uh, we can start recording now, Mel, if, if you haven't already. Um, so Aya Ananda Bodhi became interested in Buddhism in her early teens. And she lived as a monastic at Amravati and Chithurst monasteries for 17 years before moving to the USA in order to establish Aloka Vihara Forest Monastery, a place for women to train in the forest monastic tradition. In 2011, she took full bhikkhuni ordination, joining the growing number of women who are reclaiming this path given by the Buddha. Her practice is guided by the early Buddhist scriptures and through nature's pure and immediate Dhamma. Okay. And then she says that in this uh, session, she'll be giving a guided meditation and offering teachings from the first free women, poems of the early Buddhist nuns. And this book is a contemporary translation of the Terigata, Verses of Awakened Nuns at the Buddha's Time. And it's very close to her heart. So I think most people are probably here and people may still keep uh, coming in. We can probably keep the doors open, so to speak, for a good 10 minutes, I'd say. And, uh, and I'll hand over to Arunanda Bodhi, who's going to start off by leading a guided meditation. Lovely. Thank you, Ayachanda. Lovely to see you. And uh, thank you for inviting me onto this call. And lovely to see everyone, actually. And there's some people I've known for since like 90s, like Shirley and Rosie, people I've known since the 90s. It's very, very sweet to see you all. And people from America that I've known. One is now in Brazil. So there are two people from Brazil here and from all over. It's very, uh, very inspiring to see you all together interested in the practice and and also you know i know many of you are, are, are supporting aya chanda which and in her you know quite amazing endeavors to start a place for a monastery for women in england for bikunis so you know i lived in england as a, a nun for many years and there's there's that option but for bikuni for to take full ordination there are very few opportunities for women many many opportunities for men thousands and thousands of opportunities for men and very few for women so what Ayashanda is doing is 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 very um courageous and full of faith and and deep dedication in the dharma and so please support her as much as you can in her endeavors thank you and um so we're going to have a guided meditation but i'd like to begin it with a poem since we're reading from the poems here and, and i'll just show you the book called The First Free Women, and it's uh, a translation by uh, Matty Weingast, who's a good friend. He's actually staying here at the monastery at the moment, at Alakavahara, 
helping to build a meditation hut in the forest. So he's, he's also proficient in Pali and uh, sort of a, a man of many talents. And, um, and he made this very unusual and very beautiful translation of the Terry Guitar, the, the uh, inspired utterances of the enlightened nuns of the Buddha's time. And we worked together on it. He worked on it for about three years and we worked together on it for the last year and a half. And so I had a sort of a, I felt, as soon as I read them, I felt this mandate, I must make these poems available to people because they're very, they're very precious and transformative. And they speak to the, the calling that one feels in the heart. You know, when one first hears the teaching and it, it, it resonates with something that maybe has never been touched before. You know, this, these poems touch that place. So I felt I must make sure that they, each poem comes to its full uh, potential. It's, so as I've been like chief editor, you could say, with this book, and that it's available as a book, you know, to the many folk. So here it is. I'm happy that it's arrived. So I want to start with this poem, and it's uh, by Bhikkhuni Dantika. And this was actually the first poem that came through for Matty when he started translating this book. And it's just a, a reminder to have the right attitude to, uh, to our practice and, and in relation to our mind. Dantika, it's translated as the elephant. While walking along the river, after a long day meditating on Vulture Peak, I watched an elephant splashing its way out of the water and up the bank. Hello, my friend, a man waiting there said, scratching the elephant behind its ear. Did you have a good bath? The elephant stretched out its leg. The man climbed up and the two rode off together like that. Seeing what had once been so wild, now a friend and companion to this good man, I took a seat under the nearest tree and reached out a gentle hand to my own mind. Truly, I thought, this is why I came to the woods. So keeping that image in mind, letting yourself rest into this meditation, reaching out a gentle hand to your own mind. And just establishing a posture for meditation. You'll sit for 30 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, something like that, 25. Just feel the weight of your body sitting here. Allow yourself to fully arrive right here. And as it was mentioned in the chat, some people are feeling relaxed and happy and some people are feeling maybe anxious or agitated. So we just check in, what is the mood of the mind right now? Not with a, an agenda or any kind of pressure, but just to know what is the mood of the mind right now? And to reach out that gentle hand to your own mind, as it is, kindly, friendly, towards whatever you find here. So being aware of the body and the breath, 
Just letting the rhythm of your breath relax you, bring your attention into focus. So we're not focusing hard and, and tightly on the breath, but just letting the breath be that which keeps us present. Just noticing if there's any constriction in your chest or in any part of your body. Let the breath gently open that up. So you might want to take a couple of deep breaths. And then just let the breath go into its natural rhythm. Allowing yourself to settle, to open, to relax in a present way, finding that balance between presence and focus and relaxing and letting go. In a way, the breath itself invites that, the in-breath invites more energy and attention and clarity and the out breath invites that letting go. So if you find that you're very agitated, focus on the out breath, letting go. You're still aware of the in breath, but your main focus is on the letting go of the out breath. And if you're feeling dull or sleepy, then pay special attention to the in-breath, the energizing, life-giving breath. And if you're feeling kind of balanced, you just stay with the in and out breathing. And whether you're feeling dull or agitated or peaceful enough. Remember to have that relationship of friendliness towards your own mind.
before I start on the poems, I just want to take a moment to take you all in, since there's like three pages of you here. So I just want to look and see who's here and uh, feel the heart connection. So I'm going to read from uh, some of these poems and uh, just speak from them. I never quite know what's going to come through or what wants to be said. So uh, I, I was trained in the Ajahn Chah lineage, which and Ajahn Chah held quite strongly to the practice of speak from the heart. You know, uh, study enough that you understand the, the teachings clearly and then practice and then speak from what you know. So I will do my best to do that and to do, to honor his uh, guidance. So this is the poem of Rohini, Wandering Star. And uh, just before I uh, read the poem, um, just to say that first poem I read, Dantica, that was the first one that was translated by Matti and it's very, very close to the original. Just a, a very little change here and there to, to, to other translations. And then as he carried on with the work, I mean, and also he, originally he had no intention of translating the Kateri Gita. It was just, he was on retreat and then he saw one translation and he thought, oh, I wonder if I, I, wonder if I could do better or different, you know. And, and uh, Dantico was this first one that came through, the, the poem I read at the beginning. And then... Um, you know, and then it was, there was another, and then there was another, and then at some point it was almost as though the, the poems um, had their own life and, and were just kind of coming through him. And they became more um, intuitive. So some of these poems have got quite a lot of poetic license. And if you compare them to the original, you might say, well, there's a lot of words that are different there, even whole phrases that are not in there. But if you look at each of the 73 poems, there are 73 in all, each one stays um, true to the, to, the, to the essential message that is in the original Pali poem. So it's quite a brilliant piece of work, actually. So it's not just a, a rational, literal translation, but it's a, 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 a translation from the Pali with a, a deep um, understanding of practice and of somehow of like human nature. So this is the poem of Rohini, Bikuni Rohini. You don't become the cloth just because you put on robes. You don't turn into empty space just because you carry a bowl. The sun doesn't bow down. Trees don't throw flowers at your feet. Birds don't start answering when you call. The path can hold even the biggest mistakes. The path will make room for even your deepest regrets. But you don't become the cloth of the robe overnight. It can begin very quietly, something you barely even notice, like the touch of water on your skin like a knife in a drawer, like the next few minutes, unless they're your last. The path isn't a line on a map, it is a great shining world. Enter wherever you like. You might get thrown back once or twice, but if you push through the outer layers, Oh, my sisters, then you will know the true welcome that is the very essence of the path. So I'm going to read that one more time. 
You don't become the cloth just because you put on robes. You don't turn into empty space just because you carry a bowl. The sun doesn't bow down. Trees don't throw flowers at your feet. Birds don't start answering when you call. The path will hold even the biggest mistakes. The path will make room for even your deepest regrets. But you don't become the cloth of the robe overnight. It can begin very quietly, something you barely even notice. Like the touch of water on your skin, like a knife in a drawer, like the next five minutes, unless they are your last. The path isn't a line on a map, it is a great shining world. Enter wherever you like. You might get thrown back once or twice, but if you push through those outer layers, oh my sisters, then you will know the true welcome that is the very essence of the path. So on this call, there are only two of us in the robes, but uh, I think this is, this is speaking to those dedicated to the practice. And, uh, you know, there's the, there's the initial, uh, the initial awakening in a way when, when we first hear the Dharma, when the, when the teaching touches our heart, when we recognize something that's true in a world that is continuously producing plastic replicas of truth. And then we hear it and we recognize it and something awakens in us. That's like a, a kind of a going forth. And then, uh, you know, for a while it can be, we can be really very inspired and, and very high through the teachings. And it can start to feel like, oh, you know, I'm really special, you know, have, I, I can understand, I understand these teachings. And, and it, you know, it can feel like that for a while, but it's, and it can be encouraging actually on the path to have that initial inspiration and uplift. It's, it's, it's often what brings us in. That, uh, that high and maybe for a while our meditation practice is going really well and you know we might even start to think that trees are flowing, throwing flowers at our feet you know and birds are answering our call and then and then it goes a little deeper and then we have to start uh, working through the the obstacles the hindrances that are that overwhelm our minds and hearts and that can be quite difficult, you know, because sometimes we meet places where we start to meditate or if we've been meditating for a long time. We meet those places that uh, haven't been, that have been maybe pushed away or haven't been addressed or, or we've shut down around. And as we practice, we need to keep meeting those places, opening up around those places with, and I want to refer back to that previous poem with a, uh, with a kindly, you know, reaching out a kindly hand to our own mind. So with a kindly attention, we need to um, meet many, many um, places within us that we didn't know were there. And there is places of strength and, and wisdom <clears throat> that we didn't know were there, strength and wisdom, and also places of shame and uh, regret that maybe we've pushed away and covered up and kept busy so as not to have to look at. So this is, you know, the path can hold even the biggest mistakes. The path will make room for even our deepest regrets. This is very important because if we're not, if we don't allow the, if we don't allow all of it to come onto the path, then we stay sort of, you know, from here up. We might know a lot about the teachings and might be very, very articulate, very clever and, and be able to have great conversations. But it is not transforming us. So we have to allow the path 
to transform us. And uh, that can be messy at times. So I remember once my mother, when she was visiting Amravati Monastery, where I was, when I was living there, and we were standing under an oak tree and uh, she pointed out, I was talking about some challenges I was having, and, and she pointed out for an acorn to turn into an oak tree, it has to actually die and, and start to fall apart. And then from that death and falling apart, the new shoot grows. And uh, so to not be afraid of letting the process transform you, sometimes in ways that are a little bit scary for a while, because it's, it's, that's needed in order for the, for the path to, 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 to ripen and deepen and grow within you and for you to ripen and deepen and grow within the path. So don't be afraid of that. And the path, it, it accepts all of you. It, it's, it welcomes all of you. And not that you just, you know, we just stay the same as when we started, obviously, but all of us have to be welcomed in, in order that we can do this work. The whole of us. All of us in our many different personalities and characters and shapes and sizes and ages and so on. And also the wholeness of each of us has to be brought in. However it is, however it is. And then you don't become the cloth of the robe overnight. It can begin very quietly, like something you hardly notice. So that's how it goes, you know, the, the big, there's the big, wonderful insights, which often at the beginning are really quite, can often be quite remarkable. and can feel huge shifts at the beginning. And sometimes later on in the path, you have some more big shifts. But the, the work can begin very subtly. It's, and other people may notice things that we don't notice ourselves. Changes that happen just quietly and subtly within us. So we might not even notice the changes that are happening. And it can be that, um, you know, if we, we look at our practice and then we think, oh, it's not getting anywhere, you know, I'm not doing very well. And I still get really angry or I still have a lot of greed. And, and it's good to know, it's good to know what we have to work with. But uh, there may be work going on that you're not aware of that's, that's deep and subtle. Just the, the wish to keep going on the path, the, in, the willingness to keep turning towards what needs to be transformed. You know, the win willingness just to sit each day in meditation, have some time of silence, introspection, stilling. And, uh, you know, we can make the path a goal-oriented practice which is a linear way of thinking. And uh, it's sort of counterproductive, really. And even though in the, in, the, in, the, um, in common language in Buddhism, we talk about goals, you know, and attainments, and there are these English words we use, which are in some ways misleading. Because uh, an attainment isn't, you know, when we have an attainment, we're not actually getting anything. We're, we're letting go of something. We're letting go of something that's in the way of truth, that's in the way of reality, that's in the way of our, our freedom, our liberation. So, uh, you know, if you're here on this call, trust that your practice is, is working. You've shown up for this. This is good. And then just keep taking care of it. Keep nurturing your practice. So as I said, it's not a linear process. The path isn't a line on a map. It is a great shining world. Enter wherever you like. I love this image. And it's, it's like, it can be, it can be that, uh, you know, that we, we start, our awareness starts to brighten. And then the, the very ordinary world that we live in, we start to see in a new way. So uh, there's that uh, Zen teaching, you know, in the beginning, rivers are rivers and mountains are mountains. Then rivers are no longer rivers and mountains are no longer mountains. And at the end of the path, rivers are rivers again and mountains are mountains. So that's kind of pointing to when we, when we begin, 
we just see things oh yeah it's a mountain it's a river yeah i know what that is you know it's a name it's a thing we, we've got the concept and then we start to look more closely and then we start to see well where does a river begin and end are the banks of a river a river part of it or you know is other rocks are the pebbles in the river part of it or and is there actually a river at all the river is a process of constant change the water is part of it the banks are part of it the stones are part of it the fish are part of it the person watching in some ways is part of it because the person watching is calling it a river so we start to see things differently we start to take apart or um the the, the normal experience that we have and see it in a new way and then we can say like well you, you can't pin down a river anyway there is no river similarly with the sense of self if we do that practice of you know where do i begin and end is it is it when the breath touches my lips or touches my nostrils and enters me is that my breath is that me or is, is it as i breathe out is it just that that sort of cloud just out here where my breath has just come out is that still me or is it just the breath moving in and out and uh, so to to you know to explore the we get go through this time of exploring that um the reality or that unreality of our experience and it's, it's beautiful and fascinating and, and, and there's a, a shiningness to it, a brightness, because it's new and we haven't seen in, those, in that way before. And then at some point, there's, we, use, we go back to those conventions, a river is a river, you know, you can get in a boat and you can move along the river or you can cross it, it's still a river. But you know it for what it is, you know it in a deeper way. And it's the same with ourselves, you know, we still function and operate, we still have to eat and sleep and and defecate and urinate and and eat and drink and relate and plan you know all of those things not that we can plan very far these days we have to do all of that and that's the conventional normal being somebody and that's that's part of the reality and then but we also understand that it's it's a process that what i am is a process it's a it's a coming together of things for a while that will fall apart when it's the right time. So, uh, so we can see it in that way. And then there's also, you know, sometimes in meditation, we might experience the mind as bright and shining. And that's the, and then the Dhamma is just present in all, in its, in its wholeness there, in that bright, shining mind. So these are all ways that uh, we can think of, and that you may have others, other ways that you can think of as the, the path being like a great, shining world. You might get thrown back once or twice. But I'm sure we're all familiar with that. You know, the five hindrances are constantly trying to throw us back. Doubt, self-doubt, you know, doubt about the path, doubt about our ability to practice, doubt about the right meditation technique, you know, that can happen, or, or being overwhelmed with uh, fear or greed or dullness or uh, anxiety, you know, all these things can come and assail us at different times. So you might get thrown back once or twice, probably will. But if you push through the outer layers, you just keep going. Don't uh, get pushed, pushed around by those hindrances. Oh, my sister, so she's a bikuni talking to other bikunis, but this, this applies to all genders. But I'm gonna keep with the poem, oh, my sisters. Then you will know the true welcome that is the very essence of the path. So it's the sense of, of arriving or of, or of completely letting go, whichever way you want to speak about it. So, you know, we begin where we begin, with our, with our past, with our foibles, with our limitations. And we apply the practice to this as it is now. And again, in the beginning, we can have these wonderful ideals of how it's going to be and how we're going to be. And then we have to, you know, that can carry us for a while. And then we have to let that go and keep coming back to how is it right now? How, you know, what, it, what am I working with? Not what would I like it to be? As long as we keep that wish, you know, up there, how I want it to be. If, it's a, if we have it as a guiding star, it can be very good that we look up to from time to time to remind us the direction we're going in. We need 
we need to have a sense of our, the possibility of a human life, which the Buddha showed so beautifully. And, uh, and many of his disciples also um, realized and, and passed on. And that's where these poems come from, those awakened women who passed on mm -hmm. the message of their awakening. So it's really important to know that this is possible. And, and we start from where we are and we take a step at a time and we work with, we, we work with pushing through the particular hindrances that arise for us right now so that we can see truth. So that's the poem of Rohini, Wandering Star. And since we're here with Ayachanda, I of course have to read the poem of Bhikkhuni Chanda. So Chanda was, um, Bhikkhuni Chanda was, was born from a, she's born into a, a wealthy family, in a, a reasonably well-off family in a, a quite good situation. But um, similar to what we're experiencing now, there was a there was a, a sickness that went through the village that she lived in, the town that she lived in, and many people died. So we're experiencing a pandemic on a world scale. She was with with this. It seems like it was more localized to that town, to a smaller area. And, and she lost all of her family when she was a child. All of her family died. And so she was uh, in India at that time, you know, if, if for a female, you have to belong to a male. So if, you're, if you don't have a father or a son or a brother or a husband, then you're just, you're just like on the streets. And uh, so this is what happened to this little girl. So I'm going to read her poem. Chanda, the moon. Do you remember when disease came to your village? Of your family, you were the only one to survive. You were just a girl. For years, you begged for food. Then a nun took you in. You told her your story and she held you while you wept. Then she told you her story and you wept with her. Her name was Patachara. You went everywhere she went and soon left behind all that she had left behind. When you were young, you were, sorry, when you were young, you learned what it was to be truly alone. Now you know for yourself, freedom is something altogether altogether different from that. When you were young, you learned what it was to be truly alone. Now you know for yourself, this freedom is something altogether different from that. So, uh, this little girl finding a, a nun who had actually been through something quite similar. Patachara had also lost all her family, not in a, not in a, a pandemic or epidemic, but in a, a series of disasters that, that befell her family. And, and she was also overwhelmed with grief and really lost for some time, really lost and uh, quite desperate. And then she happened to, across the Buddha and the Buddha taught her the Dharma and she gained full awakening. And so when it says um, about Chanda, you went everywhere she went and soon left behind all that she left behind. So they both were able to leave behind the grief, the heartbreak of, of losing their family and to come to that place of freedom. And I, I, I very often speak about, and so I almost can't help but speak about, um, one of the very important influences in, in my life as a nun or as a human being really, was uh, meeting Venerable Maha Gosananda. And he had a similar situation where he was from Cambodia, he was a Cambodian monk, very, very beautiful, radiant being. And uh, while he was a monk he, in Thailand, 
while he was practicing in Thailand, um, in Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge was happening and all of his family and basically all of his family were killed and his um, country was destroyed. And he went through incredible grief, immense grief about this loss. And he wanted to go back to his country and help people. And his teacher said, no, don't go back. Stay, keep practicing. And then you'll have something really worth sharing with your people. And so he did that. And, and it would have been dangerous for him to go back also. But he did that and he practiced and he worked through that incredible grief, the, 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 the biggest grief that one can have, I imagine. And came out the other side as this radiant, beautiful, present, playful being. So he was very much attuned to the suffering of the world, but he wasn't pulled down by it anymore. And for me, this was so powerful to meet him, just to see this is possible for a human being. You know, so I'm not there yet. I still get sad and cry over things that happen. Some of the things in America are very heartbreaking. And, uh, but I know, I, you know, I remember him and, and what he came to, not through an idea or a, you know, an ideal, but through, through tr deep realization. And so, uh, you know, we still have work to do, but uh, he didn't bypass the grieving. The grieving was part of the work. First he went into that grieving and then deeply reflecting on the nature of samsara. He came out the other end as this uh, radiant, beautiful, compassionate being. So we all have this work to do. It's not easy, but it's uh, we're invited to do this work. And, and the you know the the world situation now, you know the big one of the pandemic, and then all of the smaller ones of the harmful things people do to each other is kind of shocking, really. Some things that happen, and you know, those things still go on on top of the on top of the tragedy of the pandemic. You know, this, and then there's also there's there's this. Um, you know, the pandemic is part of nature. Those things happen from time to time, and the human race is somewhat out of control as a, as part of nature. And, and the pandemic is a natural process. It happens in all species, um, and it's devastating. And uh, scary you know and but it is part of nature it's a natural thing and then there's the the kindness and the goodness and the courage and the and the nobility that that brings out in people and there's the um, and there are those who take advantage and 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 um you know do do harmful things despite this this incredible situation we're in so and this is samsara this is it is like this and i'm very much about the good the true and the beautiful you know and i'm i'm lucky to have uh, found a path that really holds that high and as as a as a as a as an inspiration and as a potential and yet as long as we're here in this world there will be beauty and ugliness there will be nobility and uh, profanity you know that's that's what the world is so just knowing that and and yet not letting that be a reason to no longer cultivate the good so the buddha uses this beautiful um phrase not shirking our responsibility to cultivate wholesome states <laughs> i love that not shirking our responsibility to, to cultivate wholesome states. You know, we can use the difficulties in our life to be a reason not to cultivate the wholesome and to, and to fall down into, oh, it's all terrible and it's all awful and what's the point? And, but it, and then the Buddha says, don't shirk your responsibility. As a practitioner, this is our responsibility to be the holders of the good, to, to, to bring whatever light we have, whatever light, however tiny little flicker it might be, however bright and radiant it may be, to bring our light into the world and to take care of that light and to nurture it and to, and to let it grow stronger. This is our responsibility as practitioners. So uh, since we mentioned Patachara, I want to also read her poem and then I'll open up to 
questions and answers. Questions. So Petachara, wandering robe. And this is her story of enlightenment. So this is about her practice and then the moment of awakening. Farmers turn up the soil, plant seeds and wait. All by itself, water pours down from the sky and turns earth into food. After all these years, sleeping on the ground, waking before dawn and begging for every meal, where's my harvest? Late one evening, I was washing my feet after another long day of sitting and walking. The water poured over my feet and onto the ground. I let my mind go and it flowed down a hill with the water towards my little hut. I went inside and sat on the bed and lowered the wick of the lamp. All by itself, the flame went out. So that image of the flame going out, that is uh, an, an image of Nibbana, of, of enlightenment. So in, the, in, the, in, the, in India, in the old time, and also in China, there was this image of, of uh, the f fire being inherent and clinging to a fuel. And as long as it's clinging, then the, the fire is there. So I'm actually, I'm using, Interesting, I was just talking about taking, nurturing your flame. There's all these different similes, isn't it? I talk about nurturing your flame, the flame of Dharma. This is a little bit different to this one. The flame went out. Well, but maybe when, you, when you're enlightened, you don't need to nurture it anymore. Maybe that's another way of saying it. But then you'll be just a radiant being. So you don't need to worry about it. But this is a different use of the image of the flame. Um, so she's, she's practicing and practicing and cultivating and cultivating and really working hard and then feeling feel like, gosh, where's my harvest, you know? I'm doing all this work, it's just not getting me anywhere. And then one day she, she's just dropping into presence with what is happening here and now. Late one evening, I was washing my feet, just the most ordinary thing, you know. And she would have been barefoot, so washing her feet at the end of the day before going to bed. After a long, another long day of sitting and walking, if, if trying and working hard and the water, and then her attention goes to the water. The water poured over my feet and onto the ground. I let my mind go, and it flowed downhill with the water towards my little hut. I went inside, sat on the bed, and lowered the wick of the lamp. All by itself, the flame went out. It's very sweet. So she, you know, and if you've ever had it, we used to, when we were children, we used to have gas lamps in our house. We, we lived in the country and there was often power cuts. So we had these gas lamps as alternatives and we had electricity too. But, but when the power cuts happened, we had these gas lamps and you could turn a little knob at the side and then the wick would come down and then boop, the flame would go out. And uh, so it's this image of, you know, just as she's turning down the lamp, again, doing a very ordinary thing. She's not actually sitting in meditation. She's just turning down the, the wick of the lamp and just as the as the flame goes out of the lamp her mind also awakens and the and the the clinging to the sense of self is, is let go she's liberated so this is a very beautiful image and then patachara became the teacher of chanda and who also became liberated so these these people you know these these women they they were you know, they came from all sorts of different backgrounds and some had terrible difficulties and tragedies. Some had um, wonderful conditions in which they left in order to become renunciants. And you know, so in a way, this, this, um, this collection of poems, whether you read this book or other translations, they, it points to the, you know, that you don't have to be a particular, you don't have to be a particular kind of person. You don't have to be beautiful or successful or well-educated or you know, anything, except you just need to be able to hear the Dhamma 
and and if it touches your heart you practice and then you keep practicing and then you keep practicing regardless of conditions regardless of how easy it is or how difficult it is or whether things are going well or not or not or whether you have you know other people with you who practice or other people with you who find it irritating that you practice you just keep practicing and the practice is on the cushion and it's also in your daily life in our daily lives it's all of it the whole of your life make the whole of your life your practice so i want to offer that today and uh, open up the screen the room the rooms for any questions <laughs>